welcome to Playing With Fire, the podcast for people who are ready to custom build their love. We're talking about non-monogamy, however you design it, as an individuation opportunity. Want to leave the default and make your life spectacularly you? You're in the right place. Hi. Hi. We're going to talk about desire. I like desire. <laughs> I I'm like I'm prepped. I have I have notes. notes I'm ready. I don't know about you. Well, I'm ready. I I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready because I know that desire is not simple. I have one of my favorite books on desire. I'd For like, example, here's one of the many books. <laughs> when I think about desire, and I think about all of my bookcase, because of course the thing I desire more than anything is books. Is books. Yeah, I love sex, but have you seen a library? <laughs> Come on. Um, You've seen Beauty and the Beast so many times. Uh, I am Beauty and the Beast. Okay. I am living my biggest Beauty and the Beast fantasy. That's I have a library. I have a beast. I'm good. I'm set. Um, And I'm not waiting for you to turn into something else, by the way. I don't know what that was all about. Right? Not my jam. I think, yeah. You're fine. Beast was fine. Yeah. Doing great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, well, but... Well, <laughs> Jack... Jack Morin wrote this book called The Erotic Mind. Uh, goodness, a while ago, like in the 90s, let's say 95. And I feel like, I feel like almost everybody should get a copy of this, maybe just hand it to them. I mean, not everybody, because some people aren't interested in desire and sex and, and eroticism. And that's fine. That's cool if that's you. But when it comes to actually just talking about what desire is and then how do we access more of it i think jack did a great job i really do so that's the book i turned to when i was just thinking hey what do we want to what's the jumping off point for talking about desire because so as a sex educator i can approach talking about desire from a bunch of different ways and then as a human i can talk about <laughs> approaching desire from a bunch of different ways your experiential yep life i'm into desire mm -hmm. i'm very into it um but the thing that stood out to me was that i noticed that i didn't want to record this podcast episode with you until we had actually fueled the the fires of desire between us yeah okay we were we had gone through a couple of weeks where well okay a couple a couple of months where we've just been in this house project, the moving back in process, and it's been really intense. And then we traveled and then we came back and it, it's just all been pretty hard on us. And I was feeling not a lack of intellectual desire for our sexual and romantic connection, but just a sort of dullness. Yeah. Just sort of, yeah, it was just dulled. I didn't want it, to record so, an episode on desire yeah, from that spot. It was dulled and I felt it dull. Like I didn't. You felt I, dull yourself? I felt dull myself. I wasn't bringing okay. energy into life because I felt it like sapped, drained out into the, all these projects that were demanding my attention. And I didn't, and I wish I had, um, set aside, you know, reserved some of that energy for the things that I like, because yes, I wanted these things done, but I also like for my days to have an erotic component. Well, there you go. Eros. Eros. What are we really talking about when we're talking about desire? I mean, I, I think that prioritizing Eros, the E-R-O-S, Eros, not Eros, like you're going to shoot a bow. Eros, although Eros is, you know, He's the Greek version of cupid so sure arrows, but arrows. <laughs> um but when i think about eros i think about life force yeah it's not necessarily sexual though it can be and i find the sexual component of eros to be extremely helpful in in keeping the rest of my life feeling alive and and vital and yeah. vibrant and vigorous and why is it all the words i don't know <laughs> it's a very vivacious letter there you go well so when i think about desire and i think about talking about it from the intellect i can turn to my books 
But when we talked about recording this episode, I wanted to record it from a really honest place mm -hmm. of desire for the person I was recording with. <laughs> and it was pretty, it was a pretty cool idea because what it did was make me remember that we can intentionally uh, reboot yeah. the erotic system in well, our relationship. Mm -hmm. And I think that goes to something that you wanted to talk about, which is the spontaneous versus responsive, responsive desire. Sure. Because yep, if we could just, if we just rode along waiting for the spontaneous desire and then like jumped on it and then recorded then, um, who knows how long we might have to wait. So what do you, I, let's tell everybody just real quickly yeah. what spontaneous versus responsive desire. Why do we talk about it? And what is it real quick? Well, um, my understanding of it is spontaneous desire is the desire that just in a moment, something about the world strikes you in a way and boom, you're, you're there. You, you see somebody, um, and the zap, and happens. The zap happens. Um, and responsive is some, something happens or a, a set of things happen that, um, that result in desire. Um, in other words, you got to start the car and then you're driving. <laughs> like, yeah, but you, but you don't, right. you didn't fall down a hill. You had to start the car and start intentionally driving towards something. Yeah. So there's actual data on this. Um, and I can link to the data in the show notes. Um, I find the data to be interesting, but the, the really, the long and short of it, just to get really clear is some people experience more spontaneous desire. It just like desire just boom, happens. Um, and some of us really only ever experience desire as part of a process of intentionally moving toward arousal and then experiencing arousal. <laughs> and that's fine. There's not, one's not better than the other. They're just different ways to experience arousal. Yeah. And They're... desire and arousal are very closely connected. So the reason I thought we should talk about that was that uh, it's easy to think that I don't desire when like that, I, that my desire is really low <laughs> when I don't experience spontaneous desire because the cultural yeah, story is like, story. it should just happen. It like, it should just happen. And if it doesn't, something's wrong with you and you should take a pill or I don't know, fix it. But that's, the, the data tells us that's just not how everybody works. Which just off the top of my head, that sounds kind of funny. So I don't have spontaneous desire. So I should do something to make it. Wait, that's responsive desire. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, but that, that aside. So yeah. In the cultural like... story is an issue. Um, you know, I, I had some these internal stories as a socialized boy person. Uh, and I can't, so I can't speak to a socialized uh non-boy person but uh that that that's how i was supposed to be because yeah. i was supposed to come up out of me yeah literally in your and case like you're supposed to get an erection there's literally your come up out of me and that's that's how i know when i have desire and if that's and, and this is the corollary that wasn't said but was obvious if i don't feel that i don't have desire whoops miss a lot of desire that way right we also don't get to appreciate the soft cock that way. And it's just sad. Soft cock week. Yep. Michelle Rene. Michelle has been talking about this a whole bunch. I'll link to soft cock week too, because um, it's right now, November 13th to 19th. It's about celebrating the soft cock. That's when we're recording, right? Right. I'm, middle of soft cock week. Yeah. Beginning even. Awesome. Okay. So when we don't take desire in a more nuanced and, uh, <sighs> I don't know, like a depth oriented approach to desire. Like that's how I conceive of it. When we don't do that, we miss out on how wonderful it can be to intentionally fuel desire, to intentionally lean toward desire, to create desire. Yeah. And so what happened was we had been in a bit of a lull yep. to say the least. Yeah. A lull. Yeah. Um, and we've done a good job of actually keeping that up to, over the summer, no pun intended. 
No, you did a great job. Oh, thanks. I, yeah. Thanks. Whatever. That's not the measure. That's not the measure of the whole thing. But still, thanks. over the summer, it was nice because we were doing our whole camping, glamping thing. And we were. It was a new context. There was and, an ed- there was some energy in that. And then the move in happened and we just like hit a wall yep. of exhaustion and everything else. And one good thing. And oof. yeah. And then the desire gap between us, I could feel it. it. It wasn't that we were far apart. It's that there was this sort of stale nothingness. Yeah. An uncomfortable reality. And and I get this question a lot from non-monogamous um, people who are interested in non-monogamy, but a little nervous or they're just trying it out. Um, uh, isn't that dangerous <laughs> since you have other partners? If you oh. hit a stale oh. spot, isn't it dangerous? And I will say that it sometimes does inspire me to put more attention into dating, into mm-hmm. having whatever other relationships. Yeah, sure, it does. Is that dangerous? I don't find it to be dangerous personally. What I notice is that it's a reminder that every relationship is on its own time frame, its own timeline, right. has its own purposes, its own wants, desire. Like that's fine. And we shouldn't measure the relationships by each other. Because yeah. we were in a bit of a dull spot. And the there was no real problem there until there was. And the problem wasn't, oh, we're in a we're in a, a lull and there's less desire. The problem was. Now we want to talk about desire. Hmm. And we both felt like, uh-oh. How are we going to do that? Oh. Well. So, so we did. So we did. We intentionally. So rather than talk about desire, though, we intentionally moved toward it. Mm-hmm. We turned toward all the tools that we've gathered over 13 years together and remade the the erotic connection. And it worked. It went from dull to not dull. Yay, which is great. And yay, and high fives to us. But also, I noticed I started two new work projects. <laughs> um, yeah. The outline for my latest book got completed. Like, it, it like came into sight. So the erotic energy that's up all over the place. That's why desire matters to yes. me. Yeah. Well, I was thinking about that, about how I had, like, I hadn't reserved any energy for, I hadn't reserved any erotic energy. I was just down in the doing of all these projects. And, but, but erotic energy produces erotic energy. So yeah. have, have, if I had saved space for the erotic energy I had, it would have fired up everything. Right. Instead, it all just sort of so you know, cooled down. Right. So the experience I had and you had, separately that we later really were able to 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 hone in on and see oh there's the problem there's the issue we had both entered work mode yep yeah we were working on the things that needed to get done the physical tasks of moving into the house the um the intensity of having um uh four ish children in college all of a sudden some of them were just starting for the first time so it's just yeah there was just intensity there was a lot going on and we were we were handling our business. Everything was being handled. Mm-hmm. And every night we were falling into bed next to each other, just sort of grouchy. Yep. And we were doing okay with soothing, but it, it was only boring. going so far because, yeah. And I wasn't feeling inspired anywhere else either. I was just noticing slowly, way too slowly. I wish I'd noticed it sooner that I just wasn't feeling passionate really anywhere because that that work attitude that like get more done you're measured by your productivity get it all done it was like a blanket over the fire passion yep and it did keep us from having really delicious erotic experiences together but it also quelled a whole bunch of the rest of the fire Mm -hmm. that's not actually an effective strategy for me like for life didn't it it did the opposite of getting me the kinds of things i like out of but my life so why so 13 years you'd think we'd have figured this out <laughs> so why do we fall into that that habit when all of a sudden everything felt like okay there's a lot to do 
okay, so we make our to-do lists and we do all the things and we keep crossing off the to-do lists and we keep doing more things and not doing each other. And we didn't make each other's list. You did not make my list. Yep. And I did not make your list. It's true. And I'm dating, but I'm not seeing anybody who really noticed whether I was overly busy for a couple of months. It didn't matter. Yeah. And you're not seeing anybody like regularly yeah. right now. So it, yeah, so it didn't come up. So it me. wasn't even the right. There was nothing actually turned out anywhere of any huge import. But all I felt was how far away from being alive I was. And it wasn't about the sex. I, I was, the was sex like this. is like uh, one of the clues that the, that, that the energy is flagging. It's, it's just one of the clues. It's not a source. Um, right. So... When I turned to, I, I opened up The Erotic Mind by Jack Morin because it's always a good place for me to start thinking about desire again. Um, but then I started thinking about how I was behaving. And... What did you find? There was one place where there was plenty of fire. It's not a good place. And I think... Um, Papa Jung can say it better for me than I can. There's a quote um, from Collected Works 9-1. It's um, the, an unconscious eros always expresses itself as will to will power. To power. Yeah. Where there is no love, there is will to power. And where there is will to power, one will not find love. I was entering into this sort of maniacal state like I was I was over controlling I was I was like trying to micromanage getting everything done I was grouchy and I was trying to control everything. okay I, I haven't heard you talk about this in this specific way yet and I think about that that time my my experience my own reflection on me and that time and the word that I would use most is manipulative. Because your power comes my out My power comes out different. I don't just stand in your face and say, do this now. And now do this. No, I sneak around the edges and try to make it happen. Very Loki. Uh, very oh, I wish it was Loki. That would be oh, yeah, actually a little good. <laughs> I think I, yours yours is like, it's, it's because Loki, I feel like that has a, there's a creativity the manipulation that I witnessed from you. And this was hard because well, I called you on it. Yeah. It's very little boy. Oh, it is. Yeah. I don't enjoy it. Yeah. <laughs> either because it is. It's very juvenile, it, which means it's also very ineffective. I mean, you're that's very, it. very smart. But he, but it didn't, you didn't need to be for that not to be effective. It wasn't effective. And it may, it, it invokes my mother complex. And All of a sudden, I'm in this. Day of I start day. feeling like I'm Dynamic. parental. That's not not sexy. That work for us. I mean, I am a parent who enjoys sex, and those are that is just a complete sentence all by itself. And age play as a kink does not bother me at all. In fact, we should do a whole episode we on that. Absolutely, Great. could. But just having to take care of you because oh, you're acting like a little boy, no, my... because you won't ask for what you actually need, and because nope. you're in that manipulative stance, it is not a good. It is not a good uh, look for me. It doesn't. And as an older, as I'm an oldest right, child, that is child. not hot for me. Okay. It just doesn't work for me. I'm not gonna sing for you. So, so we uh, hadn't thought about that. Power. That uh, that reach for power. Yeah. That you're describing. And but so there, totally what it was. So there we go. If um if desire is waning, if desire is is feeling stale or not present, it's I'm not saying it's going to play this way out for everybody. It won't. We're all different, but I would take a look, take a hard look at yourself. Mm -hmm. Is there a will to power? Is there um is there a part of you that is reaching for control? instead of surrendering to desire instead of lighting up with eros 
Because when I did notice that, it was, well, it was a nice sizzle on myself. I felt like I felt like I had just zinged myself. Yeah. Like, oh, okay. That's not actually how I want to show up in my loving, intimate relationships. I like my powerful self. I really do. But I do not want to show up as a micromanager. I do not want to show up as, you know, a habitual, um, like, overlord commanding how everybody behaves. It's not actually how I want to be. But it is what happens when I'm in a threat state and when I'm feeling separate from someone. Yep. So, so just looking at it, oh, okay. Well, luckily I'm a grown up and I can make a different well, you decision. Were a complicated grown up who is able to self reflect and monitor your own and decide on your own actions. Yeah. But I really appreciate you naming how when desire was not like very present, <laughs> you notice your own manipulativeness. Wow. And I know that I pointed it out at, at yeah. one point, yeah. but, but you started it. really looking started like, looking. oh, it's happening everywhere. Yeah, once, once you pointed it out is the glass broken, there it was everywhere. And now what I'm hearing is that, that I could have used that as a, um, as a as a flag as a thing to say hey your desire has slipped right because it because it works the other way where there is power there is not uh, where there's will to power there is not love love desire and, right and that doesn't mean that my desire for you has like um you know fizzled in some it's not dead it's not dead it didn't disappear it has no life force yeah, you're not breathing life into so it so that was that could have been my you to start injecting energy into my desire, right? Um, which I mean, it's a very complicated time. But but now I know, and just for like from this conversation right now, now I know. Oh, if I'm starting to feel really manipulative, look for the places that I'm not expressing and energizing my own desire. Cool. Thanks. That's right. Awesome. So here's here's something that stands out to me right now. Um, what you just noticed is that you have your own red flag. We talk about red flags in relationships all the time. Oh. We rarely talk about the fact, like, do you know your own red flags? You've got a relationship with yourself. What are your red flags? Yeah. yeah. And and actually, that's interesting. Do you mind if I use you as an example? Feel because free. we've talked about this a bunch this week. Yeah, feel free. Um, when you stop moving towards sex, mm -hmm. I know pretty quickly, like, uh-oh, things are not going well in Kenland and therefore they will trickle out all over our life. And when you say, is everything okay? What do I say? Right. Sure. Yeah. Everything's fine. Why? <laughs> yep. And when I start asking if, if you want sex, when I'm direct about it, often you slip around the corners. You're like, you think of all these reasons why there's no time. There's no energy. There's no, right. Because yeah. you huh. fall into your own yeah. hole, yep. which is that now, as soon as you slip away from desire, you notice that you don't think, well, you don't notice. You unconsciously act out the reality that you don't think you're worth yep. desire. The shame comes in yeah. and and then I have to get pack, back past that obstacle of my own shame. And you know, there's a lot more than just that in the way. So where am I going to get the energy to do that? Where do I put my energy so that I can? Right. You've used the, the term injecting energy today. Mm -hmm. And that makes me think about the um, the different ways that there are, because another term that could be used is infusing, right? So like injecting yeah. would be sort of a bolus, like here's a whole bunch all at once. Oh, yeah. That yep. can work. That's that's a way. Um, and so one of the ways that we have found it's really effective if you want to is to take an overnight at a hotel, bring whatever your pleasure toys are, whatever your kink is, like bring your stuff, pack the bag, go. That's an injection for me. I'm like, okay, yeah, we're just going saying. in because we know we've only got, you know, 25 it's, hours. It's a batch operation. It happens and then it's over and yeah. Yeah. But an infusion, nice. that's a whole other really? thing. Cool. I like this. I could say decoction, but that sounds bad. Decoction. No, anyways. <laughs> anyway. Um, in an infusion, an infusion is slower. You're going to allow the, you're not going to push new material in faster than the tissues can absorb it. 
Like the whole point is to dose that just right so the tissues can become hydrated and really fully accept. And it's not so targeted. It's like a more, more diffuse, widespread. Yeah. Uh, it's a more systemic yeah. application. Yeah. So neither of these is right or wrong, but the, what's coming to mind is um, actually what we just did. We knew we wanted to record this episode. And I said, I don't want to record it from a place where I'm feeling like an educator rather than a person alive with desire. I just, I just don't want to. I've had to do that before. Sometimes I'm scheduled to teach a class and it's just time. But this podcast is different. I want it to be about, about the, the personhood. Uh, us, the, like mm -hmm. I'm a real person making mistakes and living my life and falling out of desire as much Imagine as into how boring this podcast would be if we didn't make mistakes. Oh, well, that's true. <laughs> so instead, we knew that we needed to record it sometime in the next two weeks. And we had to travel in that time. So there was like, there was a little confusion, but we just started being mindful of like, oh, well, there's this, <laughs> there's this, this podcast out there. How do we move into desire again? How do we infuse Eros? back into our us in the space between us without demanding it take a specific form yeah it's been a little over two weeks now the first week was a lot of um tumult yeah because as soon as we started moving toward each other we fought a whole bunch mm -hmm. a whole bunch a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and a the lot. thing is, it it wasn't, it, we weren't even necessarily fighting with each other. I I noticed that I was just, I was like fighting something internally. Totally. Yeah. And I we was... we were both applying our tools. I, we never actually really got into a fight until one night, but even that was. No, but it was, was just bloody uncomfortable. uncomfortable. And now that I think about it, um, the anger that I felt in those fights was almost always pointed at me like mm -hmm. even in even I even knew that I was angry at myself about the things that got us to where we were and then when I would get angry with you it would turn out to be a projection of something right. from me on you and we were both noticing it over yeah. and over again I mean twice I was speaking to you and I'm like I'm talking about me yeah mm -hmm. and you did the same thing totally so we, so when we turned the, so, so to continue the metaphor a little bit, we started the infusion process and, um, <laughs> some resistance, there was resistance, but there was also this, yeah, I had to clear out, like oh, yeah. there was all this like clutter, all this junk in the way. Yep. And the, what's interesting to me is, you know, the erotic equation that Morin posits in the book, the um, arousal plus obstacle equals excitement. Mm -hmm. Some obstacles are sexy. <laughs> Some obstacles are not. Yeah. These obstacles, the ones I was talking about, they're obstacles like projection, like, oh, I can reflect, I can deflect this off onto you or the obstacle of literally feeling my body not, um, not being able to respond, like so tense. The neurological Those, responses, ex, my threat responses, getting in the way of right? the responses being. Those were not response. sexy and they did not help. They were not the kind of obstacles that helped. But that said, <laughs> um, as we pushed through that first week, um, just living our lives, we got to a spot where, oh, uh, yeah, there was a lot of neurological level, like embodied somatic threat response i was freaking out i was having some some panicky moments and just feeling really uncomfortable in my body and as you moved to help me you experienced some blocks too like we were both yeah. blocked mm -hmm. from the very tools we know work yeah and we would so often we would have conversations in, in a clearer mind post uh, some some conflict. And I would so often be like, I had those thoughts and I didn't act on them over and over again. And the reason I'm like really just, just outlining how this went is a lot of people um, 
talk to me and imagine, I've had a lot of people reflect to me that they imagine that my relationships are easy, or at least this relationship is easy. And just, we just know how it works now. Mm. And my experience is that it is an ongoing mystery. <laughs> yeah. Well, how, um, so I have had moments where I think I might have figured out some part of you and then you grow. And then now that now that what I figured out is no longer accurate enough to work with and yeah. I have to figure it out again. And the thing the thing that happened this time was we got to a certain a certain point where the debris, all of this obstacle, yeah. all this junk started to actually like it started to come free. It started to loosen up. It was really uncomfortable. Yeah, it was. It was really, really uncomfortable. Some of what had collected there was psychological material that I, I, I'll speak just for myself here. <clears throat> Excuse me. It was big stuff I'm moving through as we move back into a house that we've remade. And I've been working through reintegrating some child parts that were long ago exiled who don't believe that they deserve a safe healthy, happy home. And those parts were clinging. They were clinging on to anger and fighting and distance and not getting along and not being desired. Part of their selves is no one wants them. Of course, I was struggling to find my desire. And as that started to loosen up, it was really uncomfortable. And I desperately wanted you to save me from it. You can't save me from my own psychological work. No. You can be present to it though. And that's what you were doing that was impressive to me. And then I think led us to the spot where we are right now. now it, that, that lesson, that, that skill, if I even call it that yet, is long coming. Like I've been working on that for more than a decade. The ability to just be with you while you experience these things right it's not easy for for me i'm a fixer so in every in every relationship um imagining imagining each relationship no matter how many partners you have imagining the the, the dyad of every relationship so you could have you know 12 partners but in between every two points there's a relationship in every one of those dyads, there's going to be this relativity. The um, the relativity of relationships cracks me up because it means that even though I have all these tools and I have all these degrees and all this relational awareness, and I write about it all the time and I speak about it all the time and I coach on it all the time, I am still a more highly reactive partner in our relationship. I I if I have an emotional reaction, it's apt to be bigger. And therefore I'm apt to look more problematic in any given moment in this particular dyad. And you, you could choose in those moments to, to play into being like cool, calm, collected, waiting out my emotional reactivity and all that. Yeah. Being the one who isn't currently emotionally but, reacting. I mean, you, let you do your... <laughs> And something I really appreciate yeah. and that helped us get back to desire right here in this connection was that as I was having reactivity and, and I, I was feeling all that stuff, the, the obstacles like clear away, it was happening in, in a messy way. And it was just over the course of a few hours, but it was messy and I didn't feel good about it. And it made me grouchy. And I was, I was saying things that I kind of meant, but I was saying them in clunky ways that might've even been mean. I was not trying to be, it was really hard. And if I'd been talking to somebody else, I've had other partners, I would have been the calm one. The, all those things I was saying, I would have been the calm one. Okay. And the reason this matters is all I was thinking about while I was finally getting all that stuff off my chest is, well, we're trying to move toward desire. And I don't know, but this rock seems like it's in the way. And you were calm and patient, but you didn't blame me for how it was going. It was messy on this side in comparison to how messy you were being. Yeah. But it wasn't 
wrong. It was just what I was experiencing. And right on the other side of it was all my desire. Mm -hmm. Like right on the other side of it, like a few hours, boom, there. There was my arrows. There was my desire. There was my sexuality. There was all my want. And if you had... If you had not been patient and instead had been um, elevate grandiose or had mm-hmm. been prideful, yeah, my own way, yeah, I might not have felt it was safe to show you that I was back to my want. Like, oh, I found it! I moved that junk out of the way, and I'm here again. Um, because, but because you were patient enough, not perfectly patient. Oh, Lord no. It was. I mean, that was kind of rough night. Mm-hmm. But because you were patient enough. When I had broken through that, I felt like it was safe to turn to you with want, with desire, and that you wouldn't. And I I mean, you just wouldn't make me feel bad about, you know, or attempt to make me feel less than because I'm different than. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's a big thing right there. Um, Different. Especially in, in like our ways to yeah. get through the stops. Yep. And well, and so that is one thing that, that helps me keep perspective on that is, yep. So, so you were, you were being your kind of reactive. My kind is sneaky. I mean, we've already mentioned the manipulation because uh, I just keep thinking of the TikTok meme that I have seen because I am not getting the attention that I desire. I have decided I am going to cause problems on purpose. Oh, that's me, but I do it quiet. It is. So you're while, very crafty. Maybe you are Loki. <laughs> <laughs> so while you're having your Hermes, I think we there we go. Hermes. Uh, what what that cattle? That cattle was always there. Sure. I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, yeah. So while you were having your experience of our fight, yeah. Um, I was aware of my desire to continue be connected to you. Yep. And I knew that if I engaged directly in the fight that it would be to respond to what you were actually laying down to those the yeah. words, the clunky words that might not have come out the way you wanted to, if I took them literally and responded to them literally, it would have nothing to do with our connection. Oh, well, that's true. It, right? And, and this I was, is something I've learned over time. I was being childish. Because you were being childish. And I didn't think of it that way. Um, but it is what it, it's what it felt like inside. It felt and, like I was eight years old. And when I react childishly to your childishness is when things go off the rails for us most. Yeah. But interestingly, if you react paternally, that often also goes off the rails, mm-hmm. right? Because yeah, there's a very fine line of being patient and witnessing witnessing your your partner decompensating a little bit versus joining in in your own reactivity and i wish that we had gone through that period a little faster but i'm always going to wish that right no matter how really uncomfortable nice to be if could be nice if it was shorter right yeah so the neat thing is we used a few we used a few tools that worked really well. Yep. And my favorite part is that the tools we used were sort of a, they were a graduated risk dosing. And we did that without talking about it or thinking about it. Say more about that. That's Well, first we were fighting. Well, I was fighting and you were witnessing and then we were fighting and then we moved into a spot where I was just... Yeah, I'm slower than you. So it's your, the, the first path I fight is first. something like you fight, I'm confused. <laughs> and then And then it develops. But then we got to a spot where I was just feeling completely psychologically unsafe. I didn't feel emotionally safe. I didn't feel held. Um, You weren't doing anything. Nothing was wrong. I, this was all an internal experience and it was all, I lit the fire. Like I lit this fuse. I was trying to get back to desire and this was the path. Yeah. That's a really, which kind of sucked. Interesting vision. Yeah. So you lit the fuse on purpose because this stuff needed to be blown up and burned and moved and all this debris needed to get out of the way so you did it but i was so uncomfortable and then i couldn't access my tools yeah i got actually into a spot where 
yeah, it's all well and good to like work in the mental health professions or the helping professions or just to be like a socially and psychologically competent person. And then when your shit hits the fan, your shit hits the fan. Yeah. Everybody has moments. I just had an interview today with somebody for my jealousy, my most recent jealousy study. They work in the mental health profession too. They're like, yeah, and we're just people. Mm -hmm. So they were describing to me a time when they unspooled about jealousy. Yeah, we do too. And sometimes we can't remember to use our tools, but we did hit, there was a threshold moment when, and I wish that we had gotten there sooner for sure, but there was a threshold moment when I used a tool, I held my breath. I held my breath long enough so that I had to start breathing out. Like I had to take deep breaths again and I had to slow down. I did not do that consciously, mm. but that holding my breath, I held my breath for a long time. That was well over a minute and it felt very childish. I felt, I feel embarrassed a little bit just to say it now. Well, Except now you know that it's a valid tool. It's very it's essential. Just what I could think of. It was one o'clock in the morning and I wasn't thinking at all. I was grasping at straws. I couldn't think of anything. I didn't have any of my neurosomatic intelligence tools. I didn't have my, my, like my physical tools near me. And, and I couldn't remember whatever any of them were. And for some reason you didn't feel safe to bring them to me. Yeah. And so I held my breath and it felt very childish, but what happened was I held my breath long enough that I really, I was, I had air hunger. I felt like I had, so then I, I took quite a few deep, slow breaths because I just hadn't been breathing. And then after that happened, I stood up, left the room that I had felt trapped in for a couple of hours, Right. went and got my toolkit, used the, did the cranial nerve one drill, which is really, really easy. You, you can do it really easily with just like a, a bottle of essential oil and you lock one nostril and tap, 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 tap while sniffing. And it's very simple. Did that drill. I did some, a couple more rounds of air hunger, bag breathing. Then I used a straw and I, and I did the hypoglossal nerve reset. It took maybe five minutes. Yeah. And then I came back upstairs. It's a huge difference. And I put down my tool bag and I said, why didn't you bring this to me? Because the little girl in me still wished that you had figured out what she needed. And that was one of those moments when I was talking about earlier where I had thought to, but I didn't. And this is my reactivity. Like I, I could have made that easier. And there was part of me that's like, go, go do this thing. You know, that's exactly the right thing to do. Words, but you didn't. Yeah. yeah. And I, yeah. I was like, I encouraged you to go do it, but that's not what was going to work in that moment. So yeah, it's just the. So the reason I say it was graduated though, is because first I held my breath. Then I walked downstairs and right. did a few drills that I find very safe and I already know are high payoff. Then I came upstairs and I asked for something specific, something that works for me. It won't work for everyone, but I, I in, in, as part of my kink, I like impact play. I really like impact play. Now I did not want to be hurt. I had no desire to be hurt at all. But I knew that impact would help. So I got the softest toy we have it, that creates a very thuddy, um, soft impact. And I asked you to use it on me. Easy enough. It's a, it's, it's a long flogger. It's double elk. So it's very soft and thuddy. And I, yeah. Um, it was not in any way punishing I did not feel like there was any power differential. If anything, I was asking you to do something for me. Yeah, it but felt you, very um, collaborative. Yeah, and that was, so you were using that on my, on the backs of my thighs and my butt and very, it, it wasn't soft. Like you weren't, you were, you were using appropriate force the way you know to, the way I like, because we've already played this way. And all of a sudden I could feel my body and its edges again. Mm -hmm. And 
I didn't have a great big, huge crying gag. I might have, but I didn't. Like, there were a few, you know, I, I had feelings, but mostly I just felt like I could be wrapped in blankets and have a drink. You offered me a drink of water. Oh. You offered me a piece of chocolate. So what I'm... You wrapped the blanket around me and then... Yeah. And what I what I heard in that graduated risk that you described at the beginning, you would you wouldn't ask for anything. You I wouldn't, wouldn't ask for anything. I was completely shut down to or, the idea. Or open yourself to any desire. Yeah. And by the time you got through those things, those those tools and those experiences, you were able to access desire again. Right. Do you want a drink of water? You wouldn't accept one before. Nope. Do and I, want... I wouldn't ask for anything yep. and I wouldn't accept something given and, to me. And then and you move through these things and there was your desire again. Right. And the coolest part, and because I really did not know how this was going to go. And I didn't actually know I was going to tell this story during this time, but it is, it was the road back because we didn't have sex that night. No. Nope. You tucked my, the covers all around me. It was really, it was like three o'clock in the morning. We but never I mean, fight at night yeah. anymore. I mean, that's the first time we fought at that's night in years. years. Yeah. Um, but we weren't, again, we weren't really fighting. I was just kind of having a little bit of a break and it was not fun, but then we went to sleep yeah. and by the next evening, things were better. <laughs> the sex was better. A lot better. Yeah, great. It was, yeah. it was the reawakening feeling that I get after after serious BDSM play. Yeah. And all that had happened was like two minutes of some light oh, logging yeah. on top of all that. So it that was like the 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 end of it I had pretty much the same response. I had walked myself from a place of essentially deadness through a really gross, like repelling, I can't have this, I can't have attention, I can't have, I can't accept anything. And on the other side of all that ick was the need for regulation. Yes. And the need for regulation and then getting the self-regulation and, and co-regulation back made it possible for me to move, not just within my window of tolerance, but for me to access leaving my window of tolerance right. yeah, yeah. in arousal on mm -hmm. purpose. So because you felt so safety you hadn't had yeah. access to. for weeks we had been trying yeah. to stay in our window of tolerance because we'd both been stressed and we had a lot on our plates but an orgasm is by definition outside, outside of the window of tolerance, of tolerance right yeah. um and i still want to experience it but i couldn't really access that level of desire because i didn't feel safe to explore. I didn't feel safe to move dynamically and fluidly in and out of those hypo and hyper arousal states. And so we had this big time and, and you showed me that you would stand there in it and it didn't go perfectly, but the, the recovery of it was, oh, I actually, it is safe for me to move in and out of my window of tolerance. It is safe because we have the tools because we've committed to staying in the process, in the discomfort of yeah. each other's yes. experiences. Had a lot of sex since, yep. like a lot. Yeah. Um, and I hadn't realized how far away from my desire I had gotten. So would you say that desire, you talked about the threat bucket. Sure. And I, I find that a useful metaphor for, you know, when you're, when your threat bucket's all full up, there's a lot Even of a drop experiences more. you're not open to anymore. So would you say that desire adds to the threat bucket? Okay. I don't want to say that as like a okay. lock, sock, and bear. I don't want to like Do you proclaim find that. For you, desire adds to the threat bucket. I find that desire is let's let's say desire if desire is arousal right if we're thinking about desire as um well the the latin word for it um ardor there's this intensity right 
arousal. Yeah. Yeah. It requires some bandwidth. It yeah. requires there to be room mm -hmm. for me to experience. I don't have to experience desire as threat, but I do experience it as activity. Yeah. Okay. Right. It's psychologically activating and, and therefore psychologically activating. Okay. If I'm in a super high threat state already, but I'm managing and then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's then, not, a, it's not a single dimensional bucket. <laughs> There's a lot going yeah. on there. Yeah. So, so another way that this has played out for us and it, it's played out for each of us, it's played out in a bunch of my other relationships is, um, yeah. Uh, life is stressful yep. and we're all like almost everybody I've, I've been with has like also been raising kids and like life is stressful. And then you try to add a yummy sexual relationship to it. One that doesn't just have endless time of living together in the same house. And, uh, it's yeah, a challenge. it definitely adds to the overall load mm -hmm. of life. So I think this is just a complicated way of saying desire, like fueling desire isn't necessarily going to feel good all the time. Right. Because there might yeah. be obstacles in the way, there might be work to do. There might also be an opportunity for this. Like that was, I feel like the big win there wasn't the sex on the other side. The big win was, I think I've been more vulnerable with you over the last 48 hours than I have for the four years before. Which that's. Mm -hmm. and that's saying a lot because it's not like I hold back a ton, but, but a lot, a whole bunch of things that I boundaries I've been allowing to be crossed mm -hmm. ways. I've been people pleasing things that I did not realize I was accepting in my, in my sexual life, especially. Right. Yeah. Stuff that. I've been essentially just putting up with or for the whole time. Yeah, that was a high intensity I, growth experience. As, as I didn't even realize that I was yep. doing that. And then, yeah. but then here I sh I've shared with you, I can think of three or four things right yeah. off the top of my head in the last couple of days that all of a sudden I'm like, oh, oh, it's, oh, I need to tell you this because yeah. I, I can't believe this, but I've never said it before. We now have a mad Pomeranian he calling to us. We have a very desirous person. Pomeranian out in the hallway. He loves us He doesn't so understand much. why we haven't gone to bed. Yeah. Okay. I think we've said everything we can about desire in this way. I, I did would... not expect this to be an NSI issue. <laughs> like yeah, so NSI, right. neurosomatic intelligence. If you haven't listened to our earlier episode on neurosomatic intelligence, this episode will make more sense if you go back a couple of episodes and listen to the one on neurosomatic intelligence for better relationships. Because um, Ken and I have been finding this particular way of doing somatic work is just a phenomenally efficient way to move That's a good word into so regulation, mm -hmm. to just learn how to self-regulate, learn how to incorporate co-regulation. Co and I'm doing some experiments right now to see how to actually incorporate neurosomatic intelligence directly into sex itself, acts of sex, and having some really phenomenal results um, with this. So I'm going to keep talking about it because I think that this is, I think this is groundbreaking and it's so simple. It's simple, simple stuff. So such a great thing to have in the toolkit. Yeah. So I, I think we should uh, close out by just saying that there's a lot more to say about desire. There is. And I would love to hear what people might have to say themselves about desire or any questions that they have about their experiences. If this episode brought up questions, definitely email Ken, Ken, Ken. at JolieHamilton.com mm -hmm. because he's fielding questions so that we can build them into the next episodes. And the questions we've been getting are really, really helpful. Um, the whole point of this podcast is to be in conversation with you. And I think we should do a follow-up episode because um, Jack Warren posited, I think just the, the simplest set of the four co cornerstones, like what, what sort of erotic themes there are for people. So let's do a follow-up on erotic themes. Great. Because the four major erotic themes that he outlined, 
I mean, looking at the list, I'm like, I spot you and I yeah, spot me. Yeah, and I, we do not have the same core erotic nope, theme. We, we have a great overlap. Mm -hmm. And when you know what your core erotic theme is, it is much easier to create juicy, yummy sexual interactions. Yeah. Erotic interactions. Okay. This was really fun for me. And thank me you. And thank you. Thanks for bearing with me. That was a long night and that was a long few months. And yes, I really, really thanks appreciate. For your, thanks for hanging on and then being so vulnerable, brave. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. I got the interview sweats this time. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you everybody for listening. If you're enjoying playing with fire, would you please hop on over to iTunes and drop us a few stars um, leave a rating, please, please, please. It really does help. I know everybody says that it really does help. And honestly, my favorite thing is like, just send an episode that you think oh, yeah, would please. resonate with someone, send it to a friend because when you send those sorts of things, I mean, that's a love language in itself. Mm -hmm. Send it along. Okay. It was great to talk with you. Thank you so much Thank you. for being here.